Hi, this is New Time on Silk Way TV channel. We introduce you with the most visible news and important events that happen throughout this week in Kazakhstan and Central Asia. More details on politics, economy, social and cultural life with opinions from the most recognizable experts of Kazakhstan and world. I'm Anuri Mangali and this is what you'll see today. Celebration of Tsingye, national currency of Kazakhstan, what was the history behind? National Bank's ex-chairman Grigory Marchenko told in an exclusive interview to the New Time. Unfolding crisis in the Middle East, Kazakhstan supports the right of Palestinians to create an independent state. But is it even possible? New Times explainer. Visa-free policy. China opened up the borders for Kazakh citizens. What to expect now? Kazakh currency celebrates its 30th anniversary. Tenge, the name of the national currency of Kazakhstan, has undergone a lot since its first release in 1993. Tenge is, so to speak, the youngest currency among other post-Soviet countries. Earlier this week, Almaty hosted the 11th Congress of Financiers of Kazakhstan. The event was dedicated to the 30th anniversary of Tenge. New Times reporter Baljan Samigulina spoke to those who started independent history of Kazakh currency. Please watch the reportage. Kazakhstan left the rubble zone almost last after Soviet Union collapsed. The first bunch of national currency banknotes was printed in the UK, while the coins were minted in Germany. Before the official decree was issued, Kazakhstan printed paper teens in nominal value. Later, these banknotes were replaced with coins. Today, the Kazakhstani tenge, which has 18 degrees of protection, can be named as one of the most protected currencies in the world. We designed the first national currency in Kazakhstan and the first batch was printed with my signature in London. We made the right choice because the quality of Kazakh banknotes is among the best in the world. Thus, in 1994, the Tenge received a gold medal from Queen Elizabeth II of the UK for the beauty of design and quality. Within 30 years in circulation, the Kazakh currency has experienced several devaluations, being weakened by almost 100 times against U.S. dollar. The country's national currency has been influenced by oil prices, experts say. But not only. Being a part of global economy, Kazakhstan's financial market is exposed to any of the fluctuations in the world's economic system. Immediately after the introduction of the national currency, it was necessary to ensure the stability of the national currency, which depended on many factors. The economy, first of all. The measures that have been taken have made it possible to achieve the stability of the national currency. Nevertheless, periods of volatility continue. For Kazakhstan, with its relatively small economy on a global scale, external shocks are very significant for the stability of the national currency. A new series of national currency banknotes was presented at Financial Congress in Almaty. Inspired by the elements of Saka style, it reflects nomadic heritage of Kazakh people. The first banknote of 5,000 tenge will enter circulation this December. All other banknotes will be available in the market until 2025. Additionally, National Bank presented the digital tenge as a new form of payment. More than 95 central banks worldwide are exploring central bank digital currency implementation. In this list, Kazakhstan is in top 20. Uh, so central bank digital currency is a third form of currency in Kazakhstan, in addition to cash and existing non-cash uh, payments. CBDC would have two attractive features that can be attractive for end consumers. First, it can enable offline transactions, meaning that you can spend digital tenge cashless, but without internet. The integration of digital tenge alongside existing forms of payment marks a stride in Kazakhstan financial landscape. With three diverse payment methods, including the digital tenge, the country is fostering a more inclusive and technologically advanced economy, poised to meet the evolving needs of its populace in the digital age. Valjan Samigulna, Tuligen Bisimbaev, Silkovi TV channel, Almaty. 
Introduction of the national currency of Kazakhstan, Tingem, in 1993 was the first move Kazakhstan made as an independent country. The spirit of history of a new independent post-Soviet state was difficult. A lot was at stake in the role of the newly created national bank with a primary function to regulate and stabilize country's financial market was significant. My colleague Valjan Samigulina had a chance to talk to one of the first chairmen of the National Bank of Kazakhstan, prominent financier and banker. Grigory Marchenko, who shared his insights on the major events in national economy and its repercussions to the modern financial system of the country. Mr. Marchenko, thank you very much for sharing time with us. You were the head of the National Bank of uh, Kazakhstan in the, in the period of 1999 2000 when the uh, economy of Kazakhstan took its first steps and it's time of the global financial crisis. Uh, which measures you had to take in order to protect the economy of Kazakhstan at such crucial time in please? Well, actually today is the 30th anniversary of Tenge introduction. I was a member of the working group which did it uh, 30 years ago. And I think that was the first measure uh, in the financial area that we had to take as an independent country uh, because uh, we were part of the Soviet Union first and after the Soviet Union broke uh, down uh, we were members of the old uh, ruble zone so to speak. In the year uh, 99 when I was uh, appointed the governor uh, the world was still recovering from the effects of the international financial crisis of 1998 uh, which started in Southeastern Asia so we thought that the most important thing was to uh, create uh, confidence in the banking sector because then the overall volume of uh, population deposits in the banks was about 320 million dollars only mm -hmm. now it's, it's uh, 35 billion dollars so the growth is Increase. more than 100 times in uh, uh, 24 uh, years uh, so we created the deposit insurance scheme, uh, guaranteed uh, banking confidentiality, and then we did uh, quite a few things in order to create the infrastructure of the financial system, uh, which is still uh, working. Uh, we created the Kazakhstan mortgage company, uh, the um, uh, housing savings bank, and few other institutions in order to uh, maintain uh, uh, the infrastructure of our financial system. Okay, let us speak of the de uh, devaluation of 2015. People were not ready because of the increase of double increase of foreign uh, currency. And uh, how justified are such post uh, procedures? If you look at our history, the largest devaluation was actually in 1994. And it was a result of the uh, wrong macroeconomic decision by the government. Uh, which decided to clear inter, uh, enterprise arrears, so it was called. So the idea was that the central bank should create uh, or print uh, a lot of tenge, and companies which had a lot of debts to each other would use this money to repay these debts. And so central bank was very much against it, uh, but the government pushed uh, the presidential decree without the uh, signature without the approval of the central bank so central bank had to comply uh, the amount of the volume of money in circulation uh, increased by over 70 percent so and within uh, three months tenge went from 11 tenge per dollar to 40. so it was 3.5 times devaluation and not a lot of people are remembering that the uh, accumulated devaluation and actually there were sort of three uh, periods of that in 2014-2015 was also quite bad uh, but it was 2.5 times so not as bad as 1994 and that's a question which is open to discussion there are quite a few people who are uh, still talking about the fixed exchange rate but I think the experience of uh, South America in 1998 uh, South America and uh, first and foremost Southeast Asia showed that uh, fixed exchange ranges, uh, fixed exchange regimes are not uh, supportable over long term. 
And also our problem uh, geographically is that our largest neighbor is Russia. And when Russia is doing a substantial devaluation, which happened in 2008 and then in 2014, we also have to take measures because if we don't, uh, our uh, industry and especially small and medium enterprises would suffer because Russian uh, products would be substantially cheaper in dollar terms and we would be swarmed by Russian imports. And actually we had this situation in 2015. Can we say that we have come to the stability of financial sector of Kazakhstan after and especially considering the restructuring and the main uh, uh, financial institutions in Kazakhstan? Uh, there is an old expression, all cowboys work is never done. So financial stability is not something that you achieve and then you sit down and enjoy. I mean, there are always some crises somewhere. We are part of uh, uh, international economy, which is quite global. And if something happens uh, in Malaysia, Bolivia or someplace else, uh, we are still considered to be part of the emerging markets and events some negative events in one part of the emerging markets would uh, also lead to consequences for, for us. Tenge has repeatedly been included in the list of the most beautiful currencies on the planet for unique design and exclusive solutions in the field of protective elements. The design of the Tenge has changed many times. Initially, there were banknotes from 1 to 100 Tenge. 1,000 Tenge has been circulating since 1995. 2,000 Tenge was first printed in 1996, and a 5,000 Tenge banknote has been circulating since 1998. Since November, 14th, 2007, the old style money has been out of circulation. In 2006, banknotes of a new series were printed from 200 to 10,000 Tenge. In 2015, the National Bank announced new banknote of 20,000 Tenge, which started to circulate years later in 2022. First Kazakh money showcased significant historical figures like Al Farabi, Kulman Ghazi, Shokan Walihanov, Abai Kunanbayol. Ablai Khan and others. Later, the designers abandoned portraits and concentrated more on the landscapes and sides of the country. Kazakhstan fully supports the creation of internationally recognized Palestinian state of 1967 borders with the capital in East Jerusalem. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan announced this at the summit of the League of Arab States and the Organization of Islamic Countries. Murat Nurtleo stressed that Kazakhstan stands in solidarity with the member countries of the OIC and calls for an immediate cessation of hostilities in the Gaza Strip. The head of the Foreign Ministry noted that, unfortunately, Unfortunately, civilians, including children, women and elderly people, became innocent victims of the conflict. Nurtleo appealed to international and humanitarian organizations with a request to intervene in the current difficult situation in the region. At the end of the summit, participants adopted a resolution declaring that the Gaza Strip is an inseparable part of the Palestinian territories on the West Bank. Kazakhstan is a strong advocate of the two states for two nations formula in line with relevant United Nations resolutions as it is the only way to ensure a peaceful and secure future for the long-suffering Palestinian people. Our country fully supports the legitimate rights of Palestinians to self-determination and the creation of an internationally recognized Palestinian state Meanwhile, a special board with Kazakhstanis from Gaza arrived in Almaty. In total, there were 99 people on plane, including family members of citizens of Kazakhstan. According to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, after completing all mandatory procedures at the airport, evacuated citizens are provided with temporary housing, legal, medical and other assistance. The Foreign Ministry noted that the successful evacuation is the result of joint coordinated work of the Kazakh embassies in Israel, Georgia, and Egypt. 
The independence of the state of Palestine has been recognized by 139 UN member states. In addition, back in 2012, Palestine received observer status at the UN. Countries that have not recognized independence believe that the issues of creating a state should be resolved only as a result of direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian National Authority. But the question is, is this even possible? What are the origins of one of the most complex geopolitical conflicts in the history? Is there a future for an independent, universally recognized state of Palestine? Dorian Sagulov gathered all the historical data. All the details are in New Times New Explainer section. The origins of the conflict, which right now is claiming the lives of thousands of people, have to be sought in the past of the Middle East. Before the creation of Israel, Jews didn't have their own state, but considered Palestine their homeland because their ancestors lived there. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, the territory of Palestine came under British control. In the 20s and 40s, a record number of Jews arrived in Palestine fleeing the Holocaust in Europe. Great Britain was unable to control territorial and religious conflicts between the Jewish and Arab populations. In 1947, the UN voted to divide Palestine into two parts, Jewish and Arab. Thus, the state of Israel appeared on the world map. The Arab population of Palestine did not accept the UN proposal. According to historian Sultan Akimbekov, it was then that the Palestinian Arabs missed the opportunity to create their own state. Neighboring Arab countries supported the Palestinians with a military action. The first Arab-Israeli war began. Akimbekov further explained why 1967 is important when referring to sovereignty of Palestine. The date is mentioned today as one of the vital milestones of the state of Palestine. First, we must define what the 1967 border is. There was no Palestinian state then. This was the so-called Green Line, which marked the line of demarcation between Jewish settlers and Arabs at the end of the First Arab-Israeli War. This war was fought over territory, during which Jewish settlers created the State of Israel, but the Arabs did not proclaim it. Many believe that this was one of the worst decisions for the Palestinian Arabs in this regard. They immediately began a war against the Jewish settlers with the support of neighboring Arab states. Having suffered defeat, many were forced to leave their territory of residence. And it was then that the foundations were laid for this global crisis. There was a war in 1967. During this war, Israel defeated Egypt, Syria and Jordan and took territory in the West Bank and occupied the Gaza Strip. Therefore, the year 1967 is considered a milestone result that allows us to at least partially fix certain borders of Palestine. Despite the UN resolution on the right of the Palestinian people to independence, experts agree that this option is practically impossible to implement. The radical Hamas movement, whose doctrine implies the complete destruction of the Jewish people and Jewish state, is actively involved in the political life of Palestine. In 2005, Hamas won municipal elections for the first time with the support of the oppressed part of society. Since 2007, it has gained full control over the Gaza Strip. The lack of a political class capable of negotiation is an obstacle to the creation of a state, historian Akimbekov noted, adding that to the some extent the same applies to the Israeli government. The position of the parties are too different. The tragedy of October the 7th, on the one hand, gave Israel carte blanche to resolve its issue with the Gaza Strip, because the Gaza Strip was, after all, wild militarized. And now Israel, at the cost of enormous sacrifices and loss of international reputation, has firmly decided to resolve the issue for itself. There are 2.5 million people in the Gaza Strip who are now being put into choosing options. Either Israel will rule as an occupation administration or the Palestinians must go to Egypt. But in any case, all the options on the table leave no room for compromise. Following the deadly Hamas attack on Israel on October 7, Netanyahu's government declared war on the militants. However, the UN condemned Israel's response to bombing Gaza and conducting a ground operation, 
calling them a disproportionate response. On October 27, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution calling for the immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Israel rejected the resolution. According to the Middle East expert Askar Batalov, the issue of creating an independent Palestine is insoluble and calling for this from the world community, including Kazakhstan, is just a civilized attempt to stop this slaughter. Uh, the important part of this rhetoric is pressure on Israel. The position of many countries is this. We recognize and want to recognize the state of Palestine as opposed to Israel. Now everything is being done to stop Israel's action by some civilized means. The fact is that the main appeal of Kazakhstan is compliance with international law. But ignoring the resolution comes from two sides. There are radical movements in Palestine that ignore the UN resolution. And the same thing happens with official Israel. Kazakhstan has two points here, an appeal to international law and to justice. According to the latest data of official Tel Aviv, more than 1.4 thousand people died in Israel as a result of the conflict. The death toll in the Gaza Strip has exceeded 11 thousand people, of which 4.5 thousand are children, the Gaza's Ministry of Health reports. The long-term Palestinian-Israeli conflicts remains one of the most difficult problems of our time. But what will be the final point of its resolution? Negotiations or missile strikes? It's a big question. Dorian Sagulov, New Time. Another complex issue within this conflict and all conflicts in general is the spread of misleading narratives and fakes. Earlier in our studio, we spoke to Mark Feifel, the communications expert who is now leading a team of media and communication strategists based in Washington, D.C., and who was previously White House Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications and Global Outreach. We asked Mr. Feifel, among others, should we as international community promote peace regulation of the conflict in Gaza Strip? First of all, as a communications expert, do you think... Um, that some of the narratives in this ongoing conflict is missing. So I think that that's right. I think that the, the challenge with the narratives are that it, in a time of war, it's so difficult to find out what's the truth and what is, is, the, is information that's put out there to mislead or to be disinformation. So, and it's very hard to get that type of thing in real time. So for example, uh, there, there was no uh, uh, for, foreshadowing of, of uh, Hamas coming in uh, to Israel. And, and the death and destruction that happened to innocent people. And that's a very compelling and a very difficult story. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, the, re the retaliation from Israel, and that's telling a story as well. And all of these things are happening with the media trying to pay attention, trying to know what's going on. But in the cloud of war, it's very difficult to know. But what we don't need uh, in, in the world right now is another big challenge like this. It's mm -hmm. very disconcerting. It's, very, it's tragic and horrible that the Middle East is still, after all these years, having such a difficult time finding peace. We thought in some ways, with the Abraham uh, Accords that were, that were discussed and that were agreed upon, that maybe that could bring some semblance of peace to the region, mm -hmm. but it looks like that is not the case, unfortunately. Yes, and on this point, is there any possibility of ceasefire, and should we as international community push on this agenda? So instead? I think that's the difficult thing, is the tensions are so high right now. And the, the Israelis are looking for ways that they can stop this from ever happening again. And that if a ceasefire happens right now, they, they have great loss for their civilians. And they're trying to find a way that they can, they can find some level of accommodation which is, and, and that they can find some level of how do we bring about an end to this in a peaceful way. I think it's going to be very difficult. Let's moving on. Russian energy company Gazprom carries out an economic and technical analysis of gasification project of northern and northeastern regions of Kazakhstan that, according to the head of the company, Alexei Miller, is being negotiated with Kazakh authorities right now. The cooperation in energy sector was defined as key during the recent visit of Russian president to Kazakhstan. These and some other topics related to Central Asia are in an expert review of my colleague, director of the Eurasia Monitoring Analytical Research Center, Alibek Tajubayev. Alibek, good evening. The floor is yours. Hi, Ainur. I'm ready to share my four picks for today's review just in a moment.
Presidents Vladimir Putin and Kasim Jomar Tokayev met on November 9th in Astana. The heads of Russia and Kazakhstan discussed many topics, from energy to food security. The negotiations and their results illustrate the quality of Russian-Kazakh relations and their trends in recent years. It should be noted that Russia builds relations with its neighbors, including Kazakhstan, based on pragmatism, analyzing their interests. Particular attention in Kazakh-Russian relations is paid to energy security. Thus, Gazprom intends to gasify the eastern and the northern parts of Kazakhstan. Earlier, the head of the company, Mr. Miller, reported that the Russian Federation and the countries of Central Asia are discussing an agreement on cooperation in the gas sector of a period of 15 years. Meanwhile, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan, Roman Vasilenko, took part online on the first ministerial meeting of the Central Asia and the G7 countries. The meeting discussed prospects for cooperation in regional security, economics, transport, energy and investment, combating global warming and environmental protection, water management and the tourism. The G7 countries are trade and investment partners of Kazakhstan, accounting for more than 20% of the country's foreign trade balance. Last year, G7 investment in the Kazakh economy grew up by 30%, exceeding 8 billion US dollars, and trade turnover reached 30 billion dollars. Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan agreed to create a joint working group to develop terms of references for cooperation in the field of energy exchange with an emphasis on the renewable energy sources. The corresponding agreement was reached as a meeting of the ministers of energy and economy of Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan held in Baku to discuss the prospects for exporting electricity from Central Asia countries to Europe throughout the territory of Azerbaijan. Traditional energy sources in our region are coal and hydroelectric power plants. Against the backdrop of the environmental situation changes, such solutions become very relevant. On Monday, the 20th meeting of the Parliamentary Cooperation Committee of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the European Union took place in the European Parliament. During the meeting, current issues of Kazakh-European cooperation were discussed, including trade and economic relations, the development of regional policy in Central Asia, human rights, the rule of law, and the liberalization of the visa regime for Kazakh citizens. Following the meeting, representatives of the European Parliament noted that the European Parliament fully support easing the visa regime for citizens of Kazakhstan. That's it from my part for today, Ainur. Giving floor back to you. Thanks. That was Elibek Tejabai from Eurasia Monitoring Analytical Research Center with his review of the most important news topics on Central Asia. Meanwhile, visa-free regime with China that was introduced earlier will increase supplies of Kazakhstani products to the Chinese market and will make it easier to find reliable investors. The main goal of the visa-free agreement, according to the experts of the Institute of World Economics and Politics, here Sultan Jansiyitov, is to boost activity of foreign travels for the citizens of both countries. Governments of China and Kazakhstan are taking measures to maintain favorable investment climate and strengthen business relations relations, said Jan Siedov, adding that all of this will work in favor of Kazakhstan. The experts stress that Kazakh-Chinese cooperation covers almost all spheres of the economy. Last year, the Chinese direct investment in Kazakhstan amounted to $1.4 billion. Uh, it opened a very broad range of possibilities for our citizens. We should mention that uh, lots of our citizens, of our people from in Kazakhstan are having a great opportunities in doing business with China. As you know, nothing works better than when you can talk with your business partners from face to, with, uh, from face, to face, like in China, like directly seeing all the products that you're going to purchase or signing the agreements right on the place. The other thing is that uh, it's about tourism. China, is a China has a huge touristic potential for Kazakhstan's, Kazakhstanis. Uh, and I'm quite sure it will become a, one of the main destinations for uh, the external uh, tourism from Kazakhstan. Kazakhstani Tengiz oil fields output will remain stable, wrote Reuters, citing Kazakh Energy Ministry. Earlier this year, in an official statement of the ministry, it was announced that due to the urgent overhaul of one out of six processing trains at the site, there was an overall decline in oil production. What else was in focus of foreign media? International news agency Kazin Forum presents a review of media coverage about Kazakhstan this week.
Reuters reported on November 14th that output from Kazakhstan's major Tengiz oil field will remain stable in 2024, citing the Kazakh Energy Ministry. Responding to a Reuters request, the Energy Ministry said that it forecasts oil output from Tengiz will reach 27.9 million metric tons this year, or about 608,000 barrels per day, a similar level to 2023's output, but around 4% below that of 2022 reached the article. EU reporter published an article on November 15th discussing Kazakhstan's participation in the Raw Materials Week in Brussels. In a visit to Brussels to take part in the European Commission's Raw Materials Week, Kazakhstan's Minister of Industry and Construction, Kanat Sharlapayev, explained how his country is already meeting many of the EU's requirements for critical raw materials, reads the article. Kazakhstan and the EU signed a strategic partnership on critical raw materials, batteries and green hydrogen in November 2022. At a business forum on that strategic cooperation, Kazakh industry minister Kanat Sharlapayev said Kazakhstan fully supports the European Union's aspirations for diversifying sustainable supplies of critical raw minerals and is confident that the country can make a significant contribution to achieving this goal, reads the article. Forbes, meanwhile, published an article on November 16th connecting the links between Kazakhstan's diplomacy and fashion diplomacy via Kazakhstan's Fashion Week. For the world's largest landlocked country, Kazakhstan is making some big waves in geopolitics. Ancient trade routes between China, India, Russia and the West position this nation as a keystone puzzle piece on the map of Central Asia. Now its intermediary prowess is stronger than ever. The last weeks we saw visits from the French President Emmanuel Macron, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban and the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Donald Lu, three stakeholders in ongoing European security negotiations, read the article. The country understands the power of design as a tool of global advocacy as well. As early as 2015, as part of my ongoing research on emerging markets, Kazakhstan rose as a prominent case study on the successful application of fashion diplomacy tools, writes the article. Well, that's a very interesting comparison and the idea as a whole fashion diplomacy as a new way of building relations. We will continue to follow international press coverage on Kazakhstan and meanwhile take care of yourself and join the New Time program. All the main news about Kazakhstan and Central Asia you can find here. More special projects about our country you can also watch on Silkway TV channel. So stay tuned and see you later.